Do you want to become a millionaire? No, really, do you want to become a millionaire? Well, today we start a brand new series on building wealth for young people. Financial expert, author, economist, speaker, Tom Hegna is going to share with us how simple it is to really become wealthy in America today. Who is Tom Hegna? Well, he's considered by most to be the retirement income expert. For the past 30 years, he has been helping baby boomers retire the optimal way. What Tom found while helping baby boomers is that their children and grandchildren were making some serious mistakes with their money. His latest book, Tom Hegna's Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, is a roadmap for younger people to build wealth. Many people believe this is the first generation that will not be able to do as well as their parents have done. Tom disagrees strongly. He says that if young people today have the right tools and the right mindset, they will be able to easily surpass the success of their parents. You're going to hear from some of the top financial professionals in this industry as they also share their best tips for building wealth. Now, it's important to recognize that Tom Hegna does not sell any financial products. He has spent his career helping financial professionals give the very best advice to their clients. Here now is Tom Hegna. Hey, welcome to today's show. I'm so excited about our guest today, David McKnight. Uh, he's a movie star. He started in the movie, The Power of Zero. He's an author. Uh, we've shared the same stage together. He's trained thousands and hundreds of thousands of uh, advisors around the world. So, David, welcome to the show. Um, tell us about your journey in the financial services industry. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, Tom. This is really the only thing I've ever done. Right out of right out of college, right out of BYU, I got into the financial services industry. It's back in 1997, so I've been at it for over 25 years, and um, really became attuned to this idea that the fiscal trajectory of our nation uh, over the next 75 years is unstable. It's uh, we're We've promised way more than we can afford to deliver in the form of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. And um, I just became attuned to this whole idea of where our country is headed financially right around 2010. And um, I started, you know, presenting to groups, uh, you know, all across the country about the reality that tax rates, even by 2030, would have to rise dramatically or we could go broke as a country. And so um, the thing that dawned on me was that, hey, most Americans have the lion's share of their savings accumulated in 401ks and IRAs. What's going to happen to those people if tax rates were to, for example, double? How much of their hard-earned retirement savings are they going to be able to keep? So in 2013, I published a book called The Power of Zero. Okay, and the power of zero talks about the reality that tax rates down the road are likely to be higher than they are today and what Americans uh, can do to help shield themselves from those higher tax rates. And so I, I wrote the book, I threw it out on Amazon, I crossed my fingers and people just started to buy it. And uh, here we are, you know, 10 years later or so and it sold over 400,000 copies. And uh, so I go around the country speaking all about um, the fiscal condition of our country and how people can prepare themselves against the reality of, of higher tax rates down the road. So let's talk about that for a minute. So you've got seven kids. I got four kids. I've taught my kids some things about money. Share with us some of the things you teach your kids on how to prepare for what's coming. Yeah, well, I, I've got a couple of entrepreneurs. I do have seven kids. I've got a couple of entrepreneurs. I've got a 14-year-old that every, you know, every Saturday he goes out and he, he, he cleans cars and he cleans golf carts and things like that. And he's like, Dad, I, I brought home 280 bucks today. I said, well, let's, okay, all right, let's, Let's pay some tithing first. Let's give 10% to our church. Let's save 20% right off the top. And then you can spend the rest however you like. So it's this, it's this question of paying yourself first and then spending whatever's left over at the end. If you wait until the end of the month and hope and pray that there is something left over, invariably there will not be anything left over. So I just try to instill in my children this idea that you tithe first, you spend, uh, you, you, you you save 20% and then it's totally up to you how you want to allocate the rest. Yep. And that's been a principle that's really worked well. So David, why did you write the book, The Power of Zero? Well, so there's all these experts that are predicting that there will come a point in time uh, beyond which we can no longer procrastinate raising taxes. But when you look at it, 95% of the cumulative retirement balances for Americans all across the country are situated in IRAs and 401ks. In other words, they're basically saying, look, I'd much rather take a deduction at today's historically low tax rates and then sort of roll the dice and kick the can down the road on, raise, on, on paying taxes on those accounts. And to me, that seemed entirely at odds with 
strategy that would allow them to wring the most efficiency out of their retirement dollars. And so to me, it felt like I needed to raise a warning cry. Look, we're marching into the future where tax rates are likely to be much higher. Why are Americans still so addicted to that tax deduction today? Why are they contributing? Why is 95% of those retirement dollars situated within those tax deferred accounts? Uh, how much are their harder retirement savings are they really gonna, gonna be able to keep? And it seemed like writing a book was the ideal way to get that message out. And you know, if we go back to what, when IRAs and 401k started, tax rates were higher and it did make sense to take the deduction and then uh, defer the taxes, let it grow. And then when you retired and you were in a lower tax bracket, it made perfect sense. And so we all did it. But now when we know tax rates are gonna have to go higher, it doesn't make sense to me to take money out to get the deduction so that you can defer your tax and then pay them when it's higher. And so I think, I think that's one of the reasons why this book is gaining traction. But what are some of the other reasons that you see it's gaining traction? Well, I think that um, what I've somehow been able to do in the powers here is reduce some fairly complex principles down to uh, sort of simple terms. And I've basically reduced the entire investment world down to three basic types of accounts. I, I refer to them in, in buckets. And basically, you got three basic types of buckets. You got your taxable bucket. Those are your uh, emergency fund type accounts. You've got your tax deferred accounts. Those are your 401ks, IRAs. I like to talk about those in terms of being in a business partnership with the IRS and every year they get to vote on what percentage of your profits they get to keep. Not a very good business partnership. And then I talk about true tax-free investments like Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks, Roth conversions, uh, some forms of properly funded life insurance. And so I basically articulated the three types of money. And then I say, look, in a rising tax rate environment, there's an ideal amount of money to have in each of those buckets. And anything above and beyond the ideal balances in your taxable and tax deferred buckets should be systematically repositioned to tax free. You want to shift that money slowly enough that you don't rise into a tax bracket that gives you heartburn, but you want to do it quickly enough that you don't rise into, uh, but do it quickly enough that you get all the heavy lifting done before tax rates go up for good. And so I think I've been able to distill that message down into very, very simple terms. And I think people have, em have embraced it. Talk about these fiscal challenges and, and, and what do you see happening? Well, you know, David Walker rightly points out that there's not, you know, um, people aren't all that worried about it because there's no immediate crisis. There isn't an immediate crisis. It's not so much what's happening now, it's what's likely to happen over time. I mean, you look at the 33, almost $34 trillion of debt that you, that you talked about, and none of that has come from the big problems that we'll be facing in the future. None of it's come from Social Security. None of it's come from Medicare. None of it's come from Medicaid. It's come from wars, and it's come from the prescription drug program that costs $8 trillion that was an unfunded allegation. And it's come from COVID and all these different types of things. So the real spending has only just begun. OK, between now and 2033, there's going to be two trillion dollars of additional debt per year. After 2033, that's going to go up to three trillion dollars per year. So we are marching into a future where the cost of servicing the national debt will consume the entire federal budget under today's tax rate. So this is a crisis. And unless we start putting measures in place to permanently fix and, and make solvent Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, we're gonna to get to the point where 50% of our, of our income, 50% of my income and 50% of your income is gonna to go to pay for taxes. And we're not gonna get cool stuff like the Swedes get. We're not gonna get universal health care. We're not gonna get paid leave. We're gonna just take that 50% and use it to service the national debt. How can Americans protect themselves from this potential double or tripling of tax rates? Well, number one, they have to acknowledge that tax rates down the road are likely to be higher than they are today. They just have to acknowledge it. Maybe if, if, if you're not quite to that point, uh, read a few of my books, read what David Walker's saying, read what Ed Slott's saying, read what former uh, Secretary of State George Schultz said in our movie, The Power of Zero. Everybody is acknowledging that we need more revenue. Okay, so number one, acknowledge that tax rates are going to go up. Number two, acknowledge that it's okay to preemptively pay a tax before the IRS absolutely requires it of you, right? And that's the big hang up that people have about um, you know, getting to the 0% tax bracket in retirement. It requires you to pay a tax today before the IRS absolutely requires it of you. So we say, look, you can either pay it now while taxes are on sale or postpone the payment until some point down the road when tax rates are likely to be much higher than they are today. So, so the strategies that we talk about 
um, involve you paying a tax today. And you just have to acknowledge that that, that tax today is likely to be lower than it will down the road and um, get your Get your dollars repositioned to tax-free. Make sure you have the ideal balances in your tax one tax deferred, and everything else should go into that tax-free bucket. Um, any other tips for young people, David? Like, like let's think to people in their 20s and 30s. What should they really be thinking on and, and, and really positioning themselves to be successful? You know, this is where I go back to Dave Ramsey. I think Dave Ramsey, for example, has got a lot of great ideas for all the the, you know, for all the t times I hammered Dave Ramsey, he's great for young people because he's telling young people not only to save 15% of their income, which they should right off the top at the beginning of the month, they spend whatever's left over, but he's also telling them to put them in, put, put that money in tax-free accounts like Roth 401ks and Roth IRAs. So really it's a pretty simple formula. Right. Save money right off the top, put it in tax-free accounts, take a nap for 40 years, wake up, you'll have a great retirement. Now you had some career advice too. Uh, for younger people, what, what would be some of that? Like, you're, you're, you're advising your kids. Tell me what you're we're sharing with them. Well, my dad once told me, I was talking to him about what, what I should study in college. He goes, just remember, whatever you decide to do, someone has to be willing to pay you money in exchange for that service that you can provide. So I would tell people, hey, look, before you decide to do the underwater basket weaving right. major or whatever, make sure that you begin with the end in mind. What service or product or um, you know, can you bring to the world that they will in turn be willing to pay you for? And I think that if you let that be your guiding principle, everything will work out for you. Now, how can we make this message relevant for young people as well? I think, I think the key is they've got time. Right. They've got time. That's their biggest resource. Yeah, so they do have time. They do have time on their side. They, they have time value of money. They can grow and com compound those savings over a long period of time. So they... The earlier you get started in life, the better off you're going to be. You don't really earn all of your money until those last five years before retirement. So if you wait five years, you're going to miss out on that five years you know, of compounding that you would have experienced right before you retire. So the other thing is not only do you need to start early, but you need to invest tax-free. And here's why. I, I tell people that the farther out your investment horizon, the more likely your taxes are gonna be higher in the future. Um, for example, take a 20 year old that wants to retire in 45 years. Well, what's the national debt gonna be under current right. projections? You know, we're talking $70 trillion. Well, guess what? How are we gonna afford the interest on $70 trillion? We're gonna to have to raise taxes, okay? And so if you, as a young person, a 20 year old or 30 year old are investing your retirement savings into a 401k or an IRA, you're getting a deduction at today's historically low tax rates only to postpone the payment of those taxes till 20, you know, 2050 or 2060. What are tax rates going to be? So I say the farther out your investment horizon, the more it makes sense for you to invest in tax free accounts. How can our viewers find out more about you? Where can they find you? I know I can find you all over the place, but just give us some places where we can find you. Yeah, the best, the best place to go is just to powerzero.com and uh, check me out. Um, you can learn all about my books. You can learn about, um, you know, Sustainable Retirement Plan Principles. We've got frequently asked questions. We've got a lot of videos on there. So just go there. You can check me out. You can read any of my books that can be bought on Amazon as well. And you're on YouTube all over the YouTube, place as well. Right. So great. Thank you, David, for coming and sharing your wisdom with our audience today. Thanks, Tom. Welcome back. I am so excited about our next guest, Jim Silbernagel. He's been in the business since the 1980s. He's helped many generations of Wisconsin's retire uh, happy and successful. Not only the, the parents, the grandparents, he don't, going down to the great grandchildren at times. So he helps his people save money, grow it, protect it, and then distribute it, and also pass on values as a legacy. So Jim, welcome to the show. Uh, why is it so important to not just work with the, with the, with the parents and the grandparents, but also with, with the kids? Well, first of all, Tom, thanks for having me here. And uh, the thing about having multi-generations, you know, you hear the stories of, you know, from wealth to poverty and, and two or three generations. And, you know, the problem is, you know, that communication about money just isn't there and uh, people don't know how to have that communication so we're kind of we kind of dubbed ourselves the home of the family meeting and part of our process is that we bring the kids in when mom and dad feel they're ready and make sure that those values are passed to the next generation and then for grandparents you know a lot of times we're setting up 529 plans for the grandchildren and maybe setting up iras when they get their first job and if they don't learn 
the basics of how to invest, how to stay the course, the ups and downs in the market, you know, first time the market goes down, they're going to panic and get out and never invest again. So you want to make sure those values are passed down from generation to generation. You've started a podcast, you know, the Real Wealth Podcast, which has just gone crazy. It's, it's everywhere. But why did, you, why did you start and what's the primary goal? Well, you know, if you look back to the 90s uh, and early 2000s, um, basically families were okay as long as they had the SUV in the driveway and had enough room on their credit card to take the kids on vacation. And spending seemed to be out of control. You look at the debt, um, you know, credit card debt, uh, student loan debt, all, all that stuff was skyrocketing. And I think the problem was people didn't have the basic understanding of financial literacy. So my goal is if we can at least be a cog in the wheel to help with financial literacy along with folks like you and others that are uh, shouting the message from the mountaintops, um, I look at government as of the people, by the people, and we have national debt that's running out of control. Well, how can we hold our government accountable if our own households aren't accountable? How do you encourage people to prioritize saving and wealth building over spending? It's a lot more fun to spend money. So there's a couple things that people need to do. Number one is they have to take the time to sit down and figure out what their cash flow is and, and be able to separate it from wants and needs. Um, so the thing is, you need to get a good handle on your budget. You need to identify what are needs, what are wants, and then prioritize. And if you want to save for the future, um, we have a, a tool that we use with our clients, an app called Currents. And if, um, and if you check that out, we can, we, we've been helping a lot of clients. But when they first tested that product, um, there was a, uh, the average person was putting 30% of their after-tax earnings into savings. That's six times the national average. And what it works toward is the mentality of saving first. And how they do that is you determine ahead of time how much money is going into this account. And then that account automatically separates from the consumption account and the wealth building account. Well, now you have to make a conscientious decision to actually spend money versus the opposite. But that depends on delayed gratification, which is what you talk about a lot as well. Oh, absolutely. There's a, a Stanford research um, study. It's the marshmallow experiment. And if people can uh, look that up online, it's really interesting. They took, I think it was four-year-old kids, and they put a marshmallow in front of them and, and said, you can have this marshmallow, but if you wait till I come back, I'll bring you another marshmallow and you can have two. And uh, a number of the kids were successful in delaying that gratification, but a very big number of them, um, they just couldn't wait and started eating that first marshmallow. Now what's interesting is they followed up with those people much later on, and what they found is the kids that had the ability to delay gratification uh, went further in school, went further in their careers, did a better job saving. So it's something that all of us as Americans, we need to have balance. It doesn't mean you have to have one or the other, but you have to have balance. And if you don't have your priorities where you're putting a little way for the future, it's okay to spend now as long as you're taking care of that. But a lot of people wait, they're 50, 55 years old, and all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, I got five years to save for retirement. Well, you're probably gonna have to work a little bit longer. How do you get people to have that delayed gratification with every paycheck? I mean, you've got some tools that you've developed that can help them. Yeah, so I was talking about this, uh, the one app where, where you, you design what's going to savings, what's, what's going to uh, uh, the spending account. So you get people to agree um, when, when the skies are clear, right? When they're not being bombarded with those million messages you need to buy now, and, and they realize they need to save. And then the other thing is using a tool, a budget tool, where we go through a detailed budget. The problem with most budgets that people do is it's always looking in the rear view mirror. And, and people are always guesstimating. And, and one thing is, I see a lot of people prepare budgets where I tell them, here, use our tool, break it down. Well, I already got all that. And they do a spreadsheet, and one of the items is credit card bill. And they're charging everything on it. They have no idea what they're spending in any different areas. And, and I hate the word budget because that's a limiting tool. I see it as a freedom document. Because if you really do a good job at it, when your head hits the pillow at night, you know what you're safe to spend. Whether you're saving for retirement or you're in retirement, if you do a very detailed budget, you know, it's just a matter of prioritizing what's most important and living within your cash flow.
taxes are a big deal too. And I know you help people reduce or eliminate unnecessary taxes. So talk a little bit about that. So the problem with most people is they don't even understand the taxes, you know, and you know, most tax software that the accounting firms use will print a report for the people showing the effective tax rate. And what that does, so our tax rates are like a staircase. The first couple of bucks is your standard deduction or itemized deduction. There's no tax on that. Then the next step is 10%, then 12%, then 22, and it goes all the way up to 37. But it's only the money over the step that hits that higher bracket. So when they tell you the effective rate, it's the blended rate of all these brackets. So they'll get a thing that says, oh, your, your effective rate is 17.3 percent. Well, there's no 17.3 percent tax rate. And what they don't understand is if they hit that next bracket, you know, they might be at 24 percent. You know, so a lot of times people, when they're putting away for their retirement accounts, for example, they're right at the fringe. And in and, and the area that I work, most of the people are in the fringe of between the 12 and the 22 percent bracket. That's a pretty big difference. And if they're getting close to retirement, they might be in a 12 percent bracket, but they, they read a newspaper, someone in the lunchroom said they should put all their money into a Roth where they're paying the tax at 22 and then they're going to save 12. Well, that doesn't make sense. And then on the other hand, I see people that do all deductible and, and you know, um, they're in a 12% bracket. They might be in a 22 when they retire. You know, so if you don't understand those brackets, it's the biggest expense. And I get a kick out of people that are do-it-yourselfers where they're like, oh, I'm going to invest in this no-load fund. I don't need an advisor. And the average advisor fee in the, this country might be one, one and a half percent. But when you look at the top tax bracket of 37 percent and you add state and here we are recording this in New York they have a city income tax I mean if you're not paying attention to that that's the most expensive and you can't just look at the tax rates today what are the rates going to be when you're drawing it out what factors should people consider when deciding between deductible and non-deductible retirement so an IRA versus a Roth IRA or a 401k versus a Roth 401k yeah, that goes back to what are your credits or what, what is your bracket now? How close are you to the next bracket? Because, you know, we just had somebody uh, in our office where she was doing all Roth IRAs, okay? And she was fully paying the, 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 full, uh, the full funding amount, and she's a couple years away from retirement. Well, she was $2,000 into the 22% bracket. I said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take two grand put in a deductible, the rest we're going to put into Roth because her tax bracket in retirement with the income that she wanted and the sources of income where she was going to get it at, she was going to be in a 12% bracket. So we save 10% on that two grand for the years that she's before she retires and the amount of money that we save will pay her electric bill for two years. And all it is is just making a small adjustment. Right. But if you don't know where that is, that there, there's going to be a problem. Now, we've got a lot of people who haven't saved for retirement, you know, and there's no way they're going to be in the same bracket. The top two tax brackets that a lot of people are in is the 12 and the 22, right? I mean, that's middle America. And, you know, when you look at it, those brackets are increasing from 12% to 15. That's a 25% increase on the dollars in that bracket of what you're going to pay. You know, and then you have the 22 going to 25. And the other thing that they can get you on is they bring the brackets down. So not only are the rates going to be increasing, but the brackets are coming, coming down. And that's in 2026. So the thing is, it's not a matter of if you're going to pay taxes. It's when and how much. And to do those conversions now, it also can be done before you start collecting Social Security. Because if you have too much income, you're going to pay tax on your Social Security. And what about Irma? premiums on Medicare. You know, they started with one bracket and now they've got all these different brackets where the premiums can be almost four times as much depending on where your earnings are. Those are those stealth taxes that nobody really knows about. So paying the taxes now before you're in those things, I mean, we literally have people living in a tax-free retirement because of the planning they did along the way. You talk a lot about how credit scores can affect wealth building. Yeah. Talk about that for just a minute. Now, obviously, if you've got to pay 1% or 2% more 
uh, or three percent more on a car loan or a home loan that can get to be hundreds of thousands of dollars um, and but but the thing that I saw that really hit home insurance companies for your auto insurance are using credit scores and in Wisconsin if your credit score if you have a low credit score um, your premiums can be a hundred and two percent more than if you have a good credit score. So perfect driving record, everything's the same. One has a low credit score, one has a good credit score. The good credit score to low credit score, 102 percent more. What about some overlooked aspects of financial planning for young people? You know, things like if their parents need long-term care, there, there's, a, there's some over, things that people overlook. Uh, we have a caregiver crisis in the country right now, and most people in their 30s and 40s, they're not even thinking about it. But guess what? Their parents are reaching the ages where the likelihood that they will need long-term care is increasing. Now, what's the definition of long-term care? It's a stay that's expected to last 90 days or more, and, and it's going to be an ongoing thing. You've got things like Alzheimer's, where the median amount of level, uh, the median years that people suffer from that is eight. That means there's just as many people that live longer as die sooner. But if you're, if that happens to your parents, the problem that I see is. Um, everybody thinks of mom and dad in the condition they're in. Oh, they can just come in the house and, you know, they can cook and clean while I'm at work. Well, that's not the case. Right. Some of them need 24-hour care. Well, Jim, this has been great. How can people follow you? Where can they find you? If they want more information, how can they deal with you? All right. Well, there's a QR code. Just just uh, get a copy of that QR code, and, and uh, we got those tools available for you that you can find for that. Um, but uh, we work with people all over the country, and uh, if you need help, I mean, find yourself somebody that can help you, you know, and, and make sure they're talking about taxes. Make sure they're talking about cash flow, because that's how you get the optimal results. A couple hundred here, a couple hundred there, and before you know it, you've got a secure financial future. And they can, they can Google real wealth, and, and they can find you. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Jim. It's been great. All right. Well, thanks, Tom. It's been a pleasure.